Happening near the peak of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, the fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in 1911 initiated a strong reaction to working conditions and safety conditions. Protests for reform in the aftermath of the fire led to improved safety conditions in the workplace that are still in use today. The Industrial Revolution came with lots of new jobs, machines, and electricity. Bell telephones, Otis Electric elevators, and Singer sewing machines were now being used in many factories. With the old pedal pump sewing machines, only 34 stitches could be made per minute. But with the new electric machines, 3,000 stitches could be made per minute. And that is what the employees at the Triangle factory were expected to do, without making even one mistake. If a mistake was made, it would come out of their paycheck which was only $2 at most for working 14 hours. Speed mattered more than anything in the Triangle Company. With more electricity, there were more people. By the 1900s, there were almost 4 million people in the U.S., and within 40 years, that number had nearly quadrupled. Urban factories had been making 75% of all consumer products in the U.S., creating several jobs for men and women. By 1909, Americans were spending nearly $23 billion a year on ready-made clothing, and the Triangle Factory had been producing 12,000 shirtwaists per week. Workplaces were often found hiring very young children because they could work in unskilled jobs for lower wages than adults, and young children meant that they had small hands, which made them more adept to handling small parts and tools. With children working in coal mines, cotton mills, and other industrial settings, they were starting to develop serious health problems like stunted growth, bronchitis, tuberculosis, malnourishment, and scoliosis. They faced high accident rates due to physical and mental fatigue caused by hard work and long hours. Employers were basically taking children for granted. By the early 1900s, many Americans were calling child labor child slavery and were demanding an end to it. They argued that long hours of work deprived children of the opportunity of an education to prepare themselves for a better future. Instead, child labor condemned them to a future of illiteracy, poverty, and continuing misery. In 1904, a group of progressive reformers founded the National Child Labor Committee, an organization whose goal was to abolish child labor. They received a charter from Congress in 1907. The committee hired teams of investigators to gather evidence of children working in harsh conditions and then organized exhibits with photographs and statistics to dramatize the plight of these children. And children were just who were doing most of the work in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. On October 4, 1909, the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, Isaac Harris and Max Blanc, came to work to find that all of their employees had gone on strike. Being in the workplace all day long, Workers knew that conditions were not exactly safe and knew that every day they came to work, they were taking on a big risk. There was a strike in 1909 that was known as the biggest single work stoppage in New York City. The strike had over 30,000 workers involved, including Triangle employees and children. The workers were pushing for only having union shops, shortened work hours, and having higher wages. Eventually, the Manufacturers Association agreed to make hours shorter and make wages higher, but with one condition. The strikers would have to drop their demand for only having union shops. The strike leaders refused, and one by one, hundreds of shirtwaist manufacturers accepted their workers' demands for unions, although the Triangle Company did not agree. The Triangle Company made women's blouses, known as shirtwaists. The company took up the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of the Osh Building in Greenwich Village of New York City. It all started on March 25, 1911, at approximately 4.45 p.m. on the 8th floor of the Osh Building. Someone, no one knows who, threw either a cigarette or a match into the scrap bin. Eva Harris smelled burning and notified her boss, Samuel Bernstein. He tried to put it out with one of the three water pails that were on that floor, but it was not enough and the fire was already spreading. They tried to use the fire hose, but it was broken and it was too late. The fire had already spread throughout the eighth floor and was quickly jumping to the two floors above. The fireman arrived with the longest ladder in New York City, but it was 30 feet too short. The firemen tried to use their hoses, but the water stream only reached the seventh floor. The nearest switchboard was on the tenth floor. Bernstein called it and told the operator to transfer him to the ninth floor to notify them of the fire, but the operator dropped the phone and ran to get help. 
Bernstein ran up the stairs to help the 160 employees above, but there was a barrel of motor oil blocking the door. The message never got to the ninth floor. The girls on the ninth floor went to the doors to get out, and then the emergency fire exit, but they were all locked. This is because the company did not want any fabric stolen. The only escape route left was the metal fire escape. They tried to use that, but it eventually collapsed, killing more than 20 people. At about 4.58 p.m., the girls left on the ninth floor started to jump from the windows. The firemen were trying to catch them, but with the girls jumping in groups of two or three, the force was too strong. There were about 260 people working on the three floors. Most of them had been recent European, Jewish, or Italian immigrant girls. As a result of the fire, 146 people died that day. 53 jumped from the windows, 19 fell from the elevator shaft, more than 20 were crushed or fell from the fire escape, and at least 50 burned to death. On April 11, 1911, Harris and Blanc were indicted on charges of manslaughter. They were brought to trial in December of 1911 and were found not guilty. Frances Perkins witnessed the Triangle Fire working as a factory inspector in New York. Her reaction to the fire was to become a leader of reform. She would later lead a committee creating 36 new labor laws and was appointed Franklin Roosevelt Secretary of Labor. In a 1964 interview, she said, We, got, we really got a big draw out of that one uh, episode, which, as I've thought of it afterwards, seems in some way to have paid the debt that society owed to those children, those young people, who lost their lives in the Triangle Fire. It's their contribution to the people of New York that we have this really magnificent series of, of legislative acts to protect and improve the administration of the law regarding the protection of work people in the city of, in the state of New York. There were several protests from society that were trying to make workers' safety mandatory. They wanted reforms and regulations that the employers would have to meet. Eventually, the rules were changed and there were many laws made for protecting workers. For fire safety that was made apparent in the fire, doors must now open outward. Unlike in the fire, people can now open the doors without being pinned against them by people pushing from behind. At the Triangle Factory and several others, most of the doors were locked, and the ones that weren't were only 20 inches wide because the company did not want any fabric being stolen through any unwatched doors. Other reforms include the installation of sprinkler systems if a company employs more than 25 people above ground level, multiple fire exits, unblocked doors, and clear pathways to all fire exits are required. In addition, firefighting equipment must be maintained in the building. There must be fire sprinklers for higher floors and portable fire extinguishers are mandatory. Numerous reforms throughout the years after the fire to end child labor were thrown out within years of their passage by the Supreme Court. A successful reform that lasted was passed in 1936 by Congress called the Walsh-Healy Act, which prohibited that firms that are producing goods under government contract from employing workers who are under age 16. Two years later, the Fair Labor Standards Act was signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, establishing minimum wage and overtime pay. These multiple reactions to the fire have made the workplace safer for employees and given them the power to speak out when regulations are not being met. Those reforms made the workplace safer today than it was a century ago when, during the peak of the Industrial Revolution, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire gave the United States a reason to react to poor and unsafe working conditions, as well as the lack of oversight and regulations. The protests for reform after the fire led to improved safety conditions and regulations for workplaces that are still in use today. The 146 lives lost in the fire were not in vain but their lives and the reaction of onlookers and survivors reformed safety standards that are in use right now in this very place.